Welcome to Politics and Values at the Olympics. The Olympics uh, in, uh, punctuate our lives, the lives of all of us around the world, um, uh, every two years. And they strive to inspire us to the highest values of uh, fundamental principles that speak to um, social responsibility, respect, um, peace, human dignity, non-discrimination, and fair play. But in the, the Olympics have also become very complex and uh, problematic events, sometimes being platforms for hatred, corruption, and fraud. My name is Marilyn Taylor. I'm the director of the Institute for Values-Based Leadership here at Royal Roads and moderator of this first of three um, panel discussions on the Olympics. Um, our intent is to uh, highlight, hold, in fact, the complexity and, of the Olympics, its uh, triumphs and its uh, troubles, uh, to really give it a careful, thoughtful consideration that could lead us to understand what um, you know what uh, um, it takes to see our highest values show up in practice. Uh, I think it was uh, our, our 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 intent was um, also highlighted by uh, the president of the IOC, Michael Thomas Thomas Bach Bach. Mm -hmm. I'm not, <laughs> um, who uh, spoke this morning uh, to well their evening our morning to these very tensions. Um, it's my great pleasure, uh, let me just, before I fr uh, introduce the panel, uh, I would encourage any of you to send um, messages on the chat tab if you want, and we'll try to deal with some of your questions, and the ones we aren't able to deal with here, we will uh, be blogging uh, responses to. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleagues here at Royal Roads, um, uh, who, uh, Jennifer Walenga, who is uh, the director of uh, the School for Pu uh, Communication and Culture, uh, Deanna Bender, who is an adjunct professor in the Institute for Values-Based Leadership in the Leadership School, and Michael Riel, who is the, uh, a professor in also the uh, School for Communication and Culture here. Um, Jen Jennifer Rolenga's um, career as an educator and as a researcher was preceded by an extraordinary and informed, I think, to some extent, by a, an informed, by a, uh, an extraordinary experience of being a member of Canada's uh, Commonwealth World and uh, gold medalist Olympic rowing teams between 1990, 1983 and 1992. She is a coach, a dedicated coach, um, and is passionate about um, realizing sport as a path for youth uh, to achieve their highest values in their lives. Deanna Bender has been involved with the Olympic movement for 30 years as an educator, working in uh, developing values, Olympic values education in Canadian schools, and also who um, has uh, worked with the International Olympic Committee uh, as a, an educational consultant and uh, author uh, to um, to uh, launch their and and, and uh, create their uh, global uh, um, Olympic education uh, values education program. Uh, she also teaches uh, at the uh, an Olympic uh, studies program at the University of the Peloponnesus, where in uh, uh, in the International Olympic Academy, which is in ancient Olympia in Greece. And my colleague Michael Riel, who is a, uh, who was part of his um, uh, career as a, uh, as a university educator, has uh, headed a, a, a UNESCO project which studied um, the uh, uh, relationship between media and the Olympics and international politics. 
uh, as well publishing widely in sport and media, including a study that is well uh, uh, referenced uh, on the um, Super Bowl. So uh, I'm very pleased to welcome and be a part of this panel with my colleagues. And I want to actually open the first question to them, each in their own way, to respond to the question, what do they think, how do they think of the Olympics as sort of a, 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 a sporting championship event that sets itself apart from any others? Well, I, I think I can start yeah, uh, with, thanks, with that. Um, the, the Olympic Games were really an educational project. Uh, they were founded by a French educational reformer, Pierre de Coubertin, who wanted to promote sport in the schools of France and dreamed up an international event with international athletes that would help to promote that cause. And thus, the Olympic Charter, which all 200 and some odd nations that participate have to sign, uh, is based on a charter of values and educational principles. And I want to direct our viewers to the o opening ceremonies, because it is through the ritual and the ceremonies that some of these values are featured. So when you look at the television tonight or re-watch what you watched this morning, pay attention to the fact that the opening segment uh, features a special celebration of the culture of the country that's hosting. Then you have uh, Thomas Bach, who is the president of the International Olympic Committee. This is an International Olympic Committee Games and the organizing committee guy doing their little speeches. And they invite the president of the nation to open the games. And according to the Olympic Charter, and all of this is scripted, the president of the country opens the games with one statement. I declare open the games of Sochi, blah, blah, blah. And that's all he can say and he sits down, which he did. Then I, I want you to pay attention to the bringing in of the flag. Um, who's bringing in the flag? It features, it features who a country feels are key, um, key heroes, not just athletes, but heroes in their country. And of course, it's raised to the uh, Olympic anthem. I was on my jammies on the Chesterfield and I just wanted to stand up and salute while I watched that this morning. It was very inspiring. So the flag goes up and then you have the Olympic oaths. And there is an oath from an athlete, an oath from a, a, an official that actually started after the Salt Lake City Games when our figure skaters were denied a gold medal because a French judge cheated. Uh, and also from a coach, and uh, they make a promise on behalf of all the athletes. Then there's a scene with doves. They don't use real doves anymore because in several of the stadiums when they released real doves, they flew around the Olympic flame and got fried. So, <laughs> so now, now they, they create a, a sequence with the Olympic doves, and it's beautifully done in the Russian opening ceremonies. And then finally, in comes the torch and the lighting of the flame. And I don't have to tell our viewers and our participants that using flame, candle, torches in rituals goes back to the beginning of our human cultures. And uh, certainly the torch relay that went through Russia, that went through Canada, that went through the United Kingdom just inspires everybody along the route that happens to be there. And so these symbols, um, underpin the kind of ideals on which the Olympic movement is based and that separate it from other sport competitions. Thanks, Neil. Thanks. Michael? Well, in answer to the same question um, and looking behind the medals, uh, the Olympics are like some other events. For example, the World Cup is a similar scale of global spectacle and has a global audience that's somewhat similar. And in different parts of the world, you have other major spectacles but uh, built around these athletic competitions. But as Dien says, the, the origins of the games, and even today, the goals are very idealistic and explicitly so. And it gives a flavor to the games that is mm -hmm. very distinctive uh, as a way of 
bringing people together from all around the world, which is one reason we titled our report for UNESCO, Global Ritual, because we don't have many global rituals. Mm -hmm. This was, this is very unique that countries from all over the world can come together peacefully and do something that is competitive but also extremely cooperative managing all of this. So the, the idealism and the values in the games are very different from the mm -hmm. other kinds of massive activities of that type. And I'll come at it from the athlete perspective. Um, and I think really the differentiating factor has been captured so well. It really does center around those, those values, those principles. And I've got some photos, actually, if you want to pull those up, that I think really highlight this. Um, they start with this concept that the Olympics is bringing together, and, and every, I think every world championship or world event, uh, the sporting event, emphasizes similar values to what the Olympics are highlighting. But at the Olympics, you get it in multiple ways, uh, across sports, and then of course right across internationally, all the different countries coming together. But this is a, an image here of a rugby scrum. And my daughter articulated this really well for me because she started playing rugby years ago. And she said, you know, we can't do battle unless we work together. And so these two teams are really one team. I love how it's kind of a circle when you see the whole thing from above. They're inextricably linked and they're trying to compete. And in doing so, they're actually being collaborative because they're unifying around a common purpose. Um, you don't see this anywhere, I think, as well as at the Olympics. Uh, some other photos will illustrate it as well. You know, this is a, my favorite kind of rowing race is right across like that, right, where it's tight right through. You're being pushed to your limit. You can never relent. You can never give up because there's always someone just slightly ahead or slightly behind. Uh, the next one illustrates my favorite photo ever of the guys winning the gold in, in Vancouver. And, and it came down to overtime. It came down, they were pushed so hard by the goalie on the United States team. But again, this would not be possible. That joy and ecstasy in their faces isn't possible without the other team. We're all part of a, something bigger than ourselves. And then the final one, the beautiful story of Luz Long and Jesse Owens, who were, uh, you know, arch rivals, although I don't think there was a lot of animosity between the two, but it, it was poignant because this occurred at the Berlin Games, and uh, the story goes that Jesse Owens, who was probably supposed to win, but was struggling with his long jump, and Luz Long came over and actually gave him some pointers and helped him tweak his, his approach, and uh, Jesse Owens ended up winning the gold, beating Luz Long, who settled for the silver, but look at the, the embrace there, hey? and there are a series of photos captured of these two guys and the, the bond they share, and I really do believe it's that they both get it. Uh, they've been there and they understand that this shared purpose uh, can only exist in, for them in this kind of context, and it was really brought out for them. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Um, quite distinctive. When you think of uh, our hockey classics and our football classics. Uh, um, what concerns you uh, about how the, um, is there are things that you're concerned about, about uh, how, the, how the Olympics are developing um, at this moment in time? Uh, and, you know, we had a, um, a question come in from a, uh, a, 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 an observer uh, on the question of things like branding and uh, commercial use as one possible as one possible thing to consider that maybe wasn't considered back when it began in France. <laughs> well, Nancy Colden, who asked the, the question about that, I thought phrased it really well around the issues of um, in the new era with some new sports and younger athletes and trying to reach a broader audience, mm -hmm. is the exclusive use of everything Olympics uh, to for the major sponsors, excluding the, the promotion and visibility of newer athletes and newer sports and, and such. And I, I think that's a real problem. More broadly, I think that the commercialization of the Olympics has been a, well, it's been financially incredibly successful. People forget that in 1980, the Olympic movement was virtually broke. And that's when they created sponsorship and started using the television money. And now it's you know as powerful as any institution in the world. Uh, but there, that comes at an expense. At least the Olympics do limit logos and branding and all of the the blatant commercialization that you get, like you know NASCAR 
and and ski uniforms in a in a commercial yes. environment <laughs> where they're all you know that's all you see you could barely find the athlete. Uh, so the Olympics tries to concentrate on the the events and exclude those distractions, but it's it's very difficult in this kind of environment. Yeah, it's very difficult, I think, too, for an athlete not to do whatever is necessary to win if they're going to make that million bucks uh, after they win a gold medal. The pressures are incredible. I think for me, the biggest concern is, uh, or or at least the tension, is about the on the one hand, on the other hand. On the one hand, we have all of these ideals, we have all of these values, mm -hmm. everybody uh, talks about them. Uh, the question for me as an educator and as a curriculum specialist, how do we bring those values to practice? What happens on a team? What happens uh, within a, a coaching situation that communicates a value and that does not say, yeah, it's okay to take drugs. I mean, the IOC is the one who really drew the line in the sand with respect to doping because there just was not a level playing field for athletes to compete. So my focus has been on, on uh, how do we actually teach the values? How does a coach instill values? How does a teacher instill values? Uh, how, what does that look like uh, on the ground? And uh, I'm hopeful that the IOC will will move further and further in the direction of providing explicit pedagogical guidance for how do we actually uh, encapsulate those values in practice within our sports systems. Because it isn't just a, a, a thought, is it? It's no, a no, way of it, life. No, every, everybody mm -hmm. blithers about values, mm -hmm. but, uh, but we have a difficult time understanding even neurologically how that happens. Mm -hmm. It's hard work. And I, yeah. so we work together in this area, and I was a, an educator and a middle school educator for years, so share the same commitment and uh, care for the education piece. I think uh, the thing that concerns me most also is that loss of focus for the athletes. I think they are easily lured by and seduced by the commercialism that's been mm -hmm. brought into the games. I've watched it happen to my own team where we toiled in obscurity for years because no one could really see those little boats off in the distance and it just was such mm -hmm. a strange sport and no one really seemed to give it much attention but when you have success suddenly now it's mm -hmm. a commodity and uh, I watched the team change as the sponsorship came on board and the, f the focus was certainly lost. People start to be, they're rowing for the wrong reasons, they're competing for the wrong reasons and all that can do is really uh, hurt your performance. I mean it just takes your focus and performance is all about great focus. Um, and then of course with that loss of focus we, everybody loses focus. Everybody forgets why we're even playing these games and what it's really about and then we've lost something huge. Jen, I, I, just curious, I, there's another question that came uh, to us about um, uh, what are the values, what do you think are the values that enable the folks who really are able to win, in fact to win? What, what kind of values play into that? I think it's that, that uh, understanding of what winning really is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I coached little 11-year-old boys, and the other night we were having a really great game, and it ended up a tie with their you know, best friends, but also arch rivals in, in basketball. And I said to them at the end of the game, wow, I, I would have loved to have a win for you guys, you know, but it was, it was a great game. And my little guy looked at me, my own son, and looked up and went, but mama, it's not about the points. It's about how we played the game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I thought, thank you. <laughs> Good reminder. <laughs> but it's so true, you know, yeah. that that's the key value to remember what it's really for is that striving and trying to be your best and, uh, and to do it together is always going to be mm -hmm. more powerful. I think in addition to that, a, a failing that I see in fans, not just participants, uh -huh. uh, is not only like the Coopertan's great phrase about the important thing is not to win but to participate and you know that's really important in addition with the Olympics you have this this nationalism that creeps in where people become interested in following only athletes from their own country only teams from their own country well that not only kind of contradicts the internationalism of the Olympic movement it cuts down on your potential pleasures because 
some of the most astonishing Olympic performances that I've ever witnessed, from Naji Komnich to Olga Korbut to, you know, great ones, were not from my country or even sports that I followed closely. But if you're open to this incredible excellence that these athletes can achieve in these events and get over these kind of narrowing of obsession with winning or nationalism, it, it increases the, the potential of what the Olympics can mean for you. You know, as I listen to you, because I'm not inside the Olympic movement and I'm a big learner here, um, I, um, I think that in a way um, that's what we might say any kind of a human activity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is about mm -hmm. in terms of a values approach to it, a valuing of the way we play the game. Yes. Which is different than those terminal values of, you know, that uh, sort of hierarchical sense of getting on top, which, which it doesn't preclude the importance of the moment when you know that you've done it just the best it could be done. And everybody celebrates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody celebrates. And the medals. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm struggling with the focus we have in Canada on the medals and on owning the podium right now because the medal is a symbol mm -hmm. of something. It's not the medal that is so important. It doesn't, mm -hmm. you can win a gold medal, it doesn't mean you're a better person right. than someone else, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. We have lots of gold medalists who have done dicey things. Yeah. I'd also like, I think, to stress here the importance of the Olympic Games as a stimulation for participation in physical activity and sport. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. we have a global epidemic yeah. and of obesity and, um, and, and it is through watching an Olympian do something absolutely splendid, that a young person uh, begins to dream about doing something similar. Uh, and, and so I think it's important for our culture, for other cultures, to return to the de Coubertin idea that through participation in physical endeavor, something is learned that isn't learned mm -hmm. just through brain work. Uh, Pierre de Coubertin mm -hmm. truly believed that through physical effort, physical endeavor, uh, we learn things about ourselves and we learn to, to uh, push ourselves to excellence. And that's what, uh, that's the other big objective that the Olympic movement stands mm -hmm. for. You look at these, at, and the, you know, I, mean, it, I could say that b being the best that you can be applies in any aspect of life, but it's incredibly visible in sport. Mm -hmm. Which makes it a great learning tool, yeah. Yeah. in a way, in a broader yeah. way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, you know, I've been thinking that there's a, 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 a kind of a, a core, <coughs> which is all about the athletes. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, all of this stuff that goes on around, around it, again, back to the sort of, but there's also the political uh, kinds of uh, dynamics that go on. The you know we heard a great uh, discussion last night from Peter Mansbridge about you know what Putin is accomplishing politically with this, um, and and the commercial kind of core. Um, do you see that? <coughs> is there insulation for athletes and uh, w from that as they go th they move through this? And, and what what helps? Within the village, there's isolation in a sense. Uh -huh. uh, the, the Olympic Village is one of the most wonderful creations, I think, of the Olympic Games because they all live, well, except the ones who think they're too good or don't want to be bothered or whatever, and there are examples of that, but they live together. I, I can, my favorite moment from an Olympics was Calgary where my son was a runner in the village, and my favorite picture is him standing by the video games with a Russian athlete on one side and a Czech athlete on the other side teaching them how to play the video game. And at that time, the Russians and the Czechs were at each other's throats. So, or an Israeli and a Palestinian eating, uh, you know, macaroni and cheese at the same table in the, in the athlete's cafeteria. These are moments mm -hmm. with young people who are going to be leaders in the world. Uh, and are they completely isolated? Of course not because mm. they are there to We've win. Talked a little bit about that. But, but young people have wonderful ways of overcoming the kinds of political pressures that are sometimes put on them, mm. I think. Jen? Yeah, I think mm -hmm. so too. Yeah, I think we're... 
Again, I think as athletes, we were, we, they're young, you know, they're 19, 20, yeah. some of them are 16, so some of them are pretty oblivious yeah. <laughs> to what's going on, Good. but, and that's fine, and I think, again, we need to listen to them, right, yeah. they're the ones who are yeah. speaking the values and living them truly together. I think in the context you're raising it, that there is a real danger that the athletes get lost in the process, yeah. they just become kind of pawns. And at different times during the Olympic movement, that has had to be raised, like putting athletes on the IOC and, and giving them a, a voice in all kinds of questions. Sebastian Coe, for example, who headed the London Games, was one of the most activist spokespersons for athletes in the Games because otherwise there is such huge mm -hmm. media interest, commercial sponsorship interest, that the, the individual athlete becomes this teeny little figure in it. And that would so contradict everything the Olympics are supposed to be about. But it's a struggle, constant struggle, that, that two-sidedness you're referring to. And the IOC has moved to uh, an ethic of care. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was, you know, anti-doping, anti-this, anti-that. But they have moved to an ethic of care where care for the athlete, um, as, as Michael says, has become a priority. And they have, as Michael says, an athletes commission that, mm -hmm. uh, that puts mm -hmm. athletes on the IOC to speak for the voice of the athlete. And, and that was, for me, a real step, I think, in the right direction. Mm -hmm. You have a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. um, Victor from the live stream would like to know um, if the Olympic Games would be the same experience for athletes if they weren't televised. <laughs> Ooh, good question. Not even close, I would say, to be simple about Go it. Go for it, Michael. Yeah. Well, it, you're talking then about an entirely different kind of event because this is an, a global media spectacle built around athletic competition. If you remove the global media spectacle, then fine, but it's going to be more like a, you know, a high school track meet or something in terms of public attention and frankly you know the public attention is part and parcel of what motivates and excites the athletes they become global heroes in this process and I don't think uh, it's very hard to imagine that even for me you know can can I just um, suggest uh, yeah go ahead I just completely disagree Okay. okay. I think it's the first time Michael and I have disagreed on it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, I understand, but I also, having lived through it, I think we were, uh, well, again, I think it helped being in a sport that was a bit obscure because we never had any uh, television attention or global attention whatsoever until we started winning medals. And But to win those medals, we were not concerned at all whether mm -hmm. we'd be televised, and we never yeah. were very aware of it either. It was so m similar to the World Championships. It's just, again, this other opportunity to compete on a world stage, and uh, we were just focused on that race. And so it's, I'm sure there were lots of athletes who are inspired by it, but we weren't. And and even and perhaps after, though, once we won gold, then there was quite a bit. Of, we had <laughs> movies made of us and stuff like that. It changed, but I think... Uh, but I think so much of the very identification of what the Olympics are is tied into this. For example, the fact that you are part of a gold medal winning team puts you in a special category to me. If there weren't any media coverage of the Olympics, I wouldn't know or care about that. Know. You know, it makes it known. Yeah, it's an interesting question because the world's, we won the world's the year before and most of us feel more proud of that race because of what it took. But Again, I guess it was just our experience, but it's a really good question whether yeah. the shape of it has changed or, you know, and I think, again, it brings it back to, well, what's it for? And what's mm -hmm. it, what it was for was to strive, achieve mm -hmm. excellence. So it's a good conversation. <laughs> We're just about at time, but I'd love, and I think our, our viewers would love too, to hear from you a little bit briefly about what they might be looking mm -hmm. at in the coming week, um, reminding viewers that we will be joining uh, again, on a panel uh, at noon P uh, Pacific Standard Time uh, on the 14th week today and two weeks today on the 21st. First, but what should we be looking for, panel? Okay, yeah, along um, these lines. Along these well, lines. I think it ties in everything yeah. that Michael and Deanna were saying earlier. Uh, I would suggest that we watch for the stories. Try and look for stories from every country because right. you're going mm -hmm. to learn so much and you're participating by watching. It's the same thing, you know, you're still experiencing uh, the games and this, these concepts in a similar way to the athletes.
Mm-hmm. Well, in the back of my mind, I was going to say, I think you should watch for the stories. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, I, it, the Olympics are about agony and ecstasy. And the greatest stories are the ones you could never predict and you thought would never happen. And watching these young people uh, do what they came to do, and some of them do it well, and some of them fall apart, and these are the heartwarming stories. I also would like to suggest something somewhat controversial, and that is to watch the advertising. I love watching the advertising Mm -hmm. during the games because the advertisers are required by the IOC and the National Olympic Committee to have some kind of a sport or Olympic message in the advertising. And so for me, it's great advertising during the Olympic Games. Coca-Cola's ad is fabulous. Um, This is another one of those on the one hand, on the other hand kind of stories, right? So, yeah. Well, I, I have three things I'd suggest people look for, and they're obvious. One is the image of Russia. Mm-hmm. And you know we're already getting that. If you think about the complications of Vancouver's image in 2010, it's not a simple thing. It started off with complications, bad weather, and other kind, you know mm-hmm. difficulties, the luge death, and then it kicked in. What will happen with Russia's image? Secondly, Canadian performance. How how will our teams and athletes do? Not though in a narrow way that ha ha to the rest of the world because. You know, we're known as a nation that cooperates, that's uh, helpful. And if we get a story of an athlete who has done a favor for an athlete from another country, mm-hmm. maybe at some personal expense, that may be more important than any medal mm-hmm. that comes up. And thirdly, the obvious thing, look for those outstanding performances from wherever, in whatever, because they're, they're what I find just blows me away, makes me <laughs> glad I watch. Yeah. Well, stay tuned. We'll be with you next week. Thanks to our panelists. Have a great evening and fun watching on the Olympic Olympic channels. Good. Good.